Will you remark further? Representative Hayes. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. No questions, just a few comments, if I could. Please proceed, sir. Um, Madam Speaker, I don't talk very much, and I'm not the type of person that jumps in front of a camera, and uh, I guess that's kind of unusual for a politician. Um, but, I, but I felt the need to get up and, and make some comments on this. I did 33 years in law enforcement, and the last 12 years as chief of police for the uh, Putnam Police Department. Ten years before that, I did the volunteer fire department in the town of Putnam and EMS as well. I received my first life-saving award from Governor Rowland, and that was a result of me responding to um, a small auto repair shop where a mechanic was removing a gasoline tank from a car, forgetting that he had a wood stove burning in the building. That resulted in a massive explosion and fire. I went into that building as a firefighter and I found him. His name was James. And I took him out of that building and I still can see his burnt face to this day. And I rode with him in the ambulance to the hospital and he died. And I received two more life-saving awards in the next 33 years. And I couldn't go to a ceremony because I couldn't understand why I was getting a life-saving award when someone died. And it wasn't about awards. I was sent to the Connecticut Police Academy in 1986. And one of the first things we did is we introduced ourselves to the class. Ooh. I think there were 33 of us in the class. And the biggest question that came is, where the heck is Putnam? Putnam's in the quiet corner in the Northeast, and nobody knows that. And it was so bad that the instructors for the next 17 weeks joked about how they had to add to the curriculums of how to get cows out of the road, because I was there. But I can tell you what they didn't teach us is there was no officer wellness programs. There was no courses to tell us how to take care of our minds. What we were told is, be tough and don't let them know that you're scared. And that's how I served my next 33 years on the department. And when I got off, of, when I got off of um, on the job training, my first day in a cruiser by myself, the first call I went to was a motor vehicle accident, and it was a motorcycle versus a pickup truck. And I was about the second car to arrive in that scene. And that person was being loaded into the ambulance when I got there. The impact of the motorcycle and the car amputated his leg just below the knee. And as I was walking to the scene for my cruiser, I realized that the person they were loading into the ambulance was someone that I went to high school with. We didn't know each other real well, but we knew each other. And they took him in the ambulance and they drove him away. And the sergeant on the scene said to me, rookie, go pick up that leg. And I still remember how surprised I was that the leg was still warm and it had a sock and a work boot on it. And I took that leg to the hospital, and to this day I don't know why, because that's what they told me to do. Later in that shift, that same sergeant met up with me and he said, kid, are you okay? And I said, yeah, I'm okay. And he said, you need to suck it up and you need to let it go. And that same night, you know what we did? I went to my first choir practice. Choir practice was something that cops did at the end of the shift. We got together and we drank beer. And we talked and we laughed. And that's how we handled things. Probably about a year and a half later, I responded to another car accident. I was the second car to the scene. EMS wasn't there yet. The fire department wasn't there yet. It was right before Thanksgiving. 
And we noticed right away that there were four people in the car, all teenagers, three were deceased. There was a fourth teenager in the back seat, a girl, 16 years old. She was alert, she was awake, she was crying for help. Fire department wasn't there yet. I went in through the back window and I held her and promised her we were going to get her out of the car. And she died in my arms. I don't know whether on that day, watching that happen, or being sent to her mother to make that notification. I don't know which one was worse, but they both stick in my head to this day. And that night we drank beer. After that, I was um, promoted to the position of detective, and I handled all of the major investigations for the Putnam Police Department. What I did learn really quickly was Wyndham County has one of the highest rates of child sexual assault in the entire state. And I investigated dozens of child assault cases. And I got sent to Seattle where I was presented with an award from the American Prosecutor Research Institution. And I took it, but I said, I'm not, I'm not curing anything, I'm not stopping anything, I'm just doing my job. One afternoon I was sitting at my desk and I got a call from the local paramedic and he said, detective, we need you to come to the hospital. He said, we have a SIDS death up here and I don't feel right about it. So I went to the hospital and after persuading the ER doctor to let me examine the baby and I found a couple of bruises which I felt were unusual. And I asked the doctor if he was going to do an autopsy and he said, no, leave it alone. The family doesn't need that. Well, I called out to the prosecutor and I got them to order an autopsy. And this is a local hospital that I hung around with at as a police officer for many, many months. And they were so upset with me that I was doing this to this family that they stopped talking to me that day. The next morning, I was assigned to do the autopsy or go to the autopsy while it, was, while it was being done, which wasn't unusual. It is unusual that I was going to one for a five-month-old child. And I watched that autopsy. And during that autopsy, they found that there were 13 bone fractures, all in different stages of healing. And that baby's death, death was ruled a homicide and not a SIDS desk. And we had a conviction and we arrested that father and we put that father in jail. And I got promoted to senior detective at the time. And Putnam has a methadone clinic. And probably about two months later, I was sent to the methadone clinic because one of our officers had been sent there and while trying to figure out what, would hap what was happening, one of the clients at the methadone clinic stole his cruiser and ran over the officer. And when I got there, the officer was okay, the ambulance was there, his cruiser was gone, but I got a notification on the radio that the cruiser was found about a mile down the road, smashed up in the woods. So I went to that location, and I spoke with a lady that was standing in the road, and she told me a story about how she saw the cruiser crash. So being a good person, she stopped to see if she could help, except for it wasn't a police officer in the car. It was our client from the methadone clinic. And he took her out of the car, and he stole her car. Problem being, her baby, was in a car seat in her car. 
So as we started to look, I found that car, and that car took off on me. At this point, the only thing I could think of was the baby in the car seat. I didn't think about procedure and all the rules that we have to pursue, and whether or not I should chase that car or will have the right to chase that car. I chased the car. And that chase ended when I saw the car seat come out of the car into the road. The baby was okay. And that was probably the best day of my career, giving that baby back to its mother. That individual was caught a while later after he assaulted a 75-year-old lady. And he was held at the Putnam Police Department. My job the next day was to transport him to court. As we drove down the road, me in the front seat and him in the back, I noticed that he was fidgeting in the car. Didn't know what he was up to until I felt him come over the front seat. At that point, I reached down for my gun, only to find out that my holster was empty. My gun was now pointed at my head. As I reached up to grab his hand, I pushed away and he pulled the trigger. I don't know if anybody can imagine what it's like to be sitting a foot away from a gun that goes off in a car with the windows closed. We fought in the front seat. I don't know how we got in the front seat. But as we fought, he opened the door. And the two of us went out of a moving car onto the road. And that car continued about 500 feet down the road and crashed into a telephone pole. And the two of us wrestled in the road. I was able to get my gun back. And by that time, other cruisers were arriving. And they helped me subdue this person. It wasn't until one of the other cops that arrived said to me, Officer, you're bleeding. I had been shot through the hand and into the leg, and I didn't know it at the time because of all the adrenaline that was flowing through. But that was one day, it was March 15, 2001. I remember that day like it was yesterday. After that, I got promoted to captain and then chief of the Putnam Police Department. Figured all my road time was done. I'd take care of the guys that were now working for me. Until one afternoon, the dispatcher came in and said, Chief, EMS is responding to your father's house. I went there to find my 33-year-old nephew who died of an overdose of heroin. And while my family were giving each other condolences and caring for each other on the front lawn, my job was to help the undertaker take my nephew out of the house. I went 33 years without a problem. And in 2009, I was getting ready to take office as president of the Connecticut Police Chiefs Association, which, if you're a police chief, that's the biggest honor in the state you can get. And I started having nightmares. I mean, the kind that you see in a movie, where you jump out of, out of bed and you're sweating. And there were more and more frequently. And I went 33 years without a nightmare. And now all of a sudden, here they are. So I went to the doctor, tried to get some help, see what was going on. My doctor suggested that I go to a psychiatrist. I cried that day. First time in 33 years. 33 years, I never let myself cry. I cried not because of emotion. I cried because I was going to lose my job. 
That's the way it was. You didn't let this stuff go, because if you did, you weren't strong enough, you weren't emotionally stable, they took your gun, and they took your job. I begged that doctor not to tell anyone. I got treatments in another state. And other than being a little emotional right now, I've done pretty well. I'm not telling you these stories because I want sympathy or anything like that. I'm not a hero, never wanted to be, never will be. I'm telling you this story because there are police officers and there are first responders in this state that have this stuff locked inside of them and they're afraid to let it go. When I was president of the Connecticut Police Chiefs Association, we put together officer wellness. The thing I'm most proud of in my life. And I think that's what started where we are right now. These are our heroes. These are people that do what I just told you about every day. They have to know that it's okay to talk about it. They have to know that it's okay to get help. As you can guess, I'm going to support this bill. I truly wish that EMS was included in it, and I hope that next year they will be. I ask you for your support too. Thank you.